This is the McKinsey Podcast, where we help you make sense out of our world's toughest business challenges. Welcome to the show. I'm Lucia Rahili. And I'm Roberta Fasara. Those that started out by looking at AI in particular as a risk, right? This is a risk to our business model. This is a risk to our customer data, et cetera, et cetera. And at the start of some of those journeys, my, my humble opinion was, gosh, this is going to go nowhere, right? But what became quite a nice surprise for me through at least a couple of these was the pivot to being conscious of the risks, yes, but not constrained by them. That's senior partner Kate Smage. It's been a year since she, Eric Lamar, and Rodney Zemmel wrote their book, Rewired, and they're all here today to talk about how companies are and aren't adapting to digital and AI transformations, especially in the era of generative AI. In our second segment, senior partner Wesley Walden went to a client meeting instead of his son's first concert. The client's reaction taught him an important lesson about open communication. Eric, Kate, Rodney, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. So it has been a year since the three of you published your book, Rewired. You have been in probably hundreds of client conversations during that interval of time. Talk to us a bit about the premise of the book and about what still resonates with the executives you talk to vis-a-vis the challenges they face. Eric, let's start with you. I have found the themes that I think have come back over and over again is, okay, how am I going to really get significant value out of this? How should I be building my talent capabilities? What am I going to do in regards to my core systems? And can I do this at the same time? Or do I need to sequence things? And also the whole data consumption, right? How do I make data easy to consume in this world of AI? Generative AI, of course, surprised us all when it came out or came out in the form of ChatGPT. So a lot of the book was written pre-Gen AI. So the first six months of Generative AI after the book came out, we had a lot of questions about how does this change it, what's relevant, what's not relevant, and so on. And I think what we found is it really puts an exclamation point behind many of the key messages of the book. And in particular, what we have in the first chapter, the first section of the framework around business-led technology roadmap, because one of the challenges of Gen AI is it's so easy to apply and so easy to fire up a pilot that you can get stuck in this death by a thousand pilots approach and not actually get anything to really scale business impact. So what this first section of the book really talks about is the need to pick a domain, right? pick the right problem, set a really high aspiration for how you want to change that domain with a real business target against it and focus there, right? Don't do everything everywhere all at once across the organization. So that's been extremely relevant in this sort of new Gen AI world. Do you see organizations beginning to capture value from Gen AI? Or are we still too early in your view while we're on that topic? We do see organizations beginning to capture value. It's early days, right? Our survey we did earlier in this year found about 10% of companies have real value in their 2024 P&L from Gen AI or who've been pursuing it. That's a relatively small percentage. But those who have that captured value in 2024, so really in the P&L, not just in the strategic plan, we think they're the ones who've been basically following the rewired recipe that starts with this top-down business-led roadmap. I might add to this, there has been a few areas where we're seeing Gen AI hitting home runs. But we also need to differentiate the Gen AI world. And I think we miss that once in a while. There's a category of application that every company on the planet is going to use. And so we're all going to use summarization of our video conference, for example. But it is not going to be competitively differentiating, which is as a company, we're not going to make more money because we have that because everybody else has it. Then there's the other category, which goes along the lines of what I just highlighted, where the company will be investing to develop a specific applications that will provide them competitive advantage. It may be we're going to do better maintenance of our equipment. It may be that our sales organization is going to have better support and therefore will sell better. But those applications require hard work. They don't come overnight. So 
You've said that Gen AI has dovetailed with the framework that you laid out in the book. Anything that you feel is evolving that might alter the rewired framework? When we constructed rewired, it was by design technology agnostic. What has happened with Gen AI is the toolbox has gotten bigger. But everything else on how to use the toolbox, do I have the right talent to use the toolbox? Do I have the right operating model to use the toolbox? Do I have the right data to use the toolbox? All of these things remain completely the same. They are the rewired capabilities to allow an organization to win uh, in this world of digital and AI. And so, yes, great, the toolbox is bigger. We're going to do even greater things, but all the capabilities are the same. I think that's the crux, right, Eric? This has just made the question, the struggles with the how, all the more interesting, intriguing, and relevant. The notion of a of a handbook, of a guide, to be able to actually go through how do you use those different capabilities from the toolbox is more relevant than ever because it, it's hard. So as you describe in the book and as you've talked about here, so many variables need to come together in order to rewire an organization successfully. You cover a range of examples in the book, and it might be helpful to bring some of this to life a bit. Talk to us about a few of those or others that you think illustrate the types of investments and behaviors that seem to be working for companies. So you have two different types of companies out there. Those early in their journey and those that have been at this for a while. For the ones that are early in the journey, the investments that we're seeing tend to be, why don't we actually invest in ourselves as a management team to learn what it means to lead an organization in the world of digital and AI? And so how do I start to upskill my people more deeply in the organization and drive a level of capabilities that goes beyond just a handful of experts and specialists. So those would be the early organization. The ones that are more mature, they're going to really focus on an area where they're feeling that they're being slowed down. So they may say big investment in data, big investment in the operating model. And then at that point, it becomes bigger surgery on the organization And then it unlocks more value for them. The organizations that are able to get some form of human breakthrough, not just the technology breakthrough, tend to be those that are moving ahead faster. And so while in in some ways in our, our framework, it's touched on in different parts, that notion of human breakthrough, whether it is from a talent perspective, whether it's from a workflow redesign perspective, whether it's from a really thinking strategically about future of work and what roles and so on we need the human to do when that, that organization is fully tech enabled, that focus on human breakthrough equally with technology breakthrough tends to be a real unlock. So I'm going to pick an example that's not in the book, and that's an example called McKinsey and Company. We've had the the benefit of having to take our own medicine on this over the last year, right? So when Gen AI uh, hit the scene, we chose to build our own rather than take something that was pre-existing off the shelf. And then really we worked through in creating what became Lily, which is a Gen AI platform that we're using originally for knowledge management, but now for many more things across our firm. We really followed the playbook in a fairly rigorous way from creating a real agile operating model with the right delegated accountability to drive it to really thinking through data and how to create something amazing that combines our own proprietary data with the world's public data in a safe way that doesn't have that leak to the outside world and in a way that really is going to encourage people to keep to keep sharing and to get the data governance set up in the right way and really thought about how to drive adoption and scaling to an extent where we now have more than 70% of our firm using this on a regular basis. And any learnings there, Rodney, on the topics of human breakthrough, either on encouraging adoption, upskilling for implementation? Was it relatively easy for 70% of the firm to use Lily, or did we take special steps there that other organizations might learn from? So relatively easy to get trial, right? People are curious and they'll try it once, right? But to get persistent usage, right? Again, it's back to the rewired recipe of really thinking through 
the user journey and being frontline centric on how it's going to be used. So it's not just a one-off, but actually it's embedded into how they're supposed to do their work on a week-to-week basis. I might offer two examples of companies out there and the kind of investments they're making. So my first one will be a large Japanese conglomerate who's really feeling behind. They're early in the journey. And for them, the critical investments that they're making now is really build up the capability of their senior management team, C-suite and CEO, and then picking a few areas, a few lighthouses where they're really going to accelerate and build their confidence, to be honest. There's a step early on that's about confidence building, and that's the investments that they're going to make. But I will take another example, a large New York bank. And for them, they've been at this for years. And now they have hundreds of agile teams that are innovating in the company. The next move for them is how are we going to reorganize differently to really unleash quite a bit of innovation across the enterprise, but in a way that's organized, not in a way that feels like everybody's doing whatever they want. And so for them, the theme is operating model. And that's where they're making the big investments to get to the next stage of rapid innovation in their business. So that's how I would contrast different investments depending on the stage where you're starting. So what kind of financial goals are appropriate to set based on a company's stage of investment? We had in the Rewired book a line that said, if your digital transformation or AI transformation is not delivering 20% improvement in your EBITDA or more, you're probably not creating ambitious enough roadmaps. And that line in our different conversations with companies has triggered a fairly simple re-questioning. Because usually what you will find is that it actually won't make a difference to the EBITDA line For many companies, when they take stock of what they're working on, they're seeing a bunch of pilots, they're seeing a bunch of little experimentation. And then when the C-suite takes stock, they go, you know what? We're completely failing that test. We're not even in the ballpark. And then others are actually pretty happy, like they're getting in that sweet spot in that range. And then execution becomes obviously the next big question. But having a quantum to test yourself against, and I'm not saying 20% is the right number, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 25, it doesn't matter all that much what is the exact number, but keeping ourselves honest that we cannot spend our time as a senior management team chasing stuff that's not going to move the bottom line by 20% or more in the next three years. And so if the digital transformation that you have today doesn't meet that bar, maybe it's time to reset your ambition. So if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, Pilots need to be undertaken. You don't want to move into the death by a thousand pilots mode, but there needs to be some kind of aspiration or metric that these pilots can be measured against in order to move forward and then to be operationalized at scale. The three of you are talking to clients every day and taking organizations that are early on in their journey and embarking on these pilots. Any that you see that you thought were completely unlikely to work but then did work and that did meet whether it's 15% or 20% or whatever the metric was for success and what others might be able to learn from those. This delta that I've seen or movement maybe that I've seen is those that started out by looking at AI in particular as a risk, right? This is a risk to our business model. This is a risk to our customer data, et cetera, et cetera. And at the start of some of those journeys, my my humble opinion was, gosh, this is going to go nowhere, right? They, they're going to tie themselves in knots at, at all the possible things that could go wrong. But what became quite a nice surprise for me through at least a couple of these was the pivot to being conscious of the risks, yes, but not constrained by them. And so organizations that have are not looking at AI as being, gosh, it's created all of these risks, but rather say, This is now giving us a platform to, as a leadership team, discuss the risks, understand them, figure out where our posture is on them, and really have 
a way forward about what responsible AI means to, to me. I've seen a number of organizations move night and day and people that I thought were going to get nowhere with their transformations have really unlocked it because of a richer, a deeper, a better, frankly, conversation about risk. One that surprised me, really surprised me, is the use of Gen AI to modernize legacy platforms. So you have an estate of software applications that were developed 30, 40 years ago in COBOL, and they are still running, largely in banks, but in other industries, they are still running today. And it's been a nightmare to try to modernize this software, this old software estate. Now there's Gen AI possibilities that I have seen work at one of my bank client to actually modernize that, co that old COBOL code and modernize it into a modern Python code. Now it's not 100% automated, but it's at least now, today, 50% automated in the sense that all of this stuff can be 50% done at the click of a button. That I did not think was possible. And what I love about that example, Eric, is an organization that said, here are my universal truths, right? Here are the underlying assumptions of what I can do, can't do, where the ceiling is on certain things, and then use technology to break them. All of those corners of the jigsaw that the organizations have, it's really interesting to see, well, if I move that a little bit, move it to the left, move it up, move it down, what then can technology do to, to change where that piece sits? Are there any use cases of Gen AI that at the outset of this process, when Gen AI sort of exploded onto the scene, that you thought, okay, this is going to be a slam dunk, but then have been far more complex or difficult to implement or that have fallen short in terms of results? And if so, what can others learn from those? So for me, actually, and this may be a controversial one, is I think I've been surprised at how hard it has been to actually deliver the efficiency benefit. And I see a lot of organizations do the math. And the math is relatively simple. We can all do it. And you can get to some pretty heady numbers about what level of productivity improvement the technology can unlock. But actually releasing that is still super hard. And it's hard because it tends to occur task by task. And it's hard because we all frankly have long backlogs that we don't get to in the days. And it's hard because the, the value map, if you like, of really understanding where and how that is taken out is still a bit fuzzy in most organizations. I will build on Kate's point. She's so right. We fall in love with the potential and the big numbers, and we forget how hard it is to actually get it done. So I'll give you an example. I'm excited about the potential of Gen AI to automate the work in contact centers, but it doesn't happen with, okay, let's load up the Gen AI software. Everybody can go home and it's done. Let's go through the steps. We got to figure out, okay, what are the types of calls that we could automate? So a change of address, that's a perfect call for automation. But you know what? What getting a change in your mortgage terms and negotiating new fees, maybe that one cannot go through Gen AI. And then, okay, for the ones we're routing toward Gen AI, how do we then avoid the risk? There's examples of airlines that promise basically benefits for frequent flyers who were basically calling into the contact centers and they were made up because the risk had not been handled and they got sued for it. And so now that we have those calls going to the Gen AI route, then how do I manage the risk, the potential consequences? And so there's a whole bunch of work that needs to happen on that side as well. And then once of all of that is in place for the agents that are there to handle the calls that are supposed to go to the agent, how do we then upskill them to say, you're going to receive a different types of calls? And that's hard work. Yeah, I still think, look, there's, there's no question it's, it's proven harder than the hype to capture the value. You can trace it back to one of the sort of one of the failure modes we talk about in Rewired, right? Either you're starting on the wrong problem, or you're doing it with the wrong level of aspiration, or you're doing it in the wrong operating model. Looking ahead, what do you see surfacing either as challenges or as opportunities 
in the next horizon for tech-enabled transformations? There's something, I think, in that around the next horizon for, for technology is really how you build for scale. How at the start of doing something, you look at it and say, what happens when we're wildly successful around this? What then? And I think that will hold true for how we build the technology. It will hold true for how we rewire the organization. It will hold true for how we raise the bar around value creation potential. But for me, there's a really big theme in here about scaling. I think scaling is the name of the game. We're nowhere near the finish line because we are now entering the phase of how do we build organization that can scale digital and AI innovation across all of their processes. And so it's going to be, it's going to be the next 10 years is the years of operating model, product and platform operating model that allows many agile teams to innovate in a way that is coherent. The next 10 years is about something that Kate and Rodney have coined in their most recent article, which I love, IT as a service. IT becoming easy to consume by the rest of the organization so they can also drive their own innovation. So after 29 years doing what we do, I actually think it's about the evolution of leadership. And I think we're at a turning point where in the future, maybe this is five years, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, there aren't going to be business leaders and technology leaders, right? Every business leader is going to need to be a technology leader, right? It's an and, not an or. And I think where the book has struck a chord is it's given business leaders a manual to understand what it means to be a technology leader. And it's given technology leaders in organizations a way of communicating with their business leadership to say, look, this is what needs to happen about really driving impact. Of course, it's about technology, but it's never just tech, right? It's this six-part recipe that we think is needed to really make a difference. Eric, Kate, and Rodney, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure. Outstanding. Nice being with you. Thanks for having us. Next up. Senior partner Wesley Walden shares how one of his clients reacted when he prioritized work instead of family. I had a, a big meeting that I had to do with the CEO and I. I flew around five hours across the country to be there for this meeting on a Friday afternoon. I was very nervous and I sat in his office and partly through our conversation, my phone buzzed with a message and, and a picture came up and, and it was a picture of my six-year-old son at, at his first school concert. And the CEO saw it and he said to me, oh, what's that? And I saw my son's first, first school concert and my wife's just sent me a picture. And he looked at me in complete shock and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I wanted to make sure I was here in person for this meeting because it's an important conversation. And he said, you're crazy. He said, if my daughter and my son had a school concert this afternoon, there's no way I would be here in this meeting with you. And it really taught me a great lesson about balancing family priorities and work priorities. And, and most importantly, the fact that our clients are, are real people they all have families and they're all balancing their busy jobs with their family priorities as well. It also encouraged me to have open conversations with my clients about whether or not I had a major family event or a major personal event. In fact, it actually makes you more human when you share those priorities. Thanks so much for listening to the McKinsey Podcast. I'm Lucia Rahili. And I'm Roberta Fasaro. Find us on McKinsey.com. We'll have a transcript of this episode up shortly. And download the McKinsey Insights app where you can find this podcast and other helpful content updated daily. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to leave a rating and a review. We'll see you in two weeks. 